Reverse engineering um, is used all over the place. As you say, it is at a high level. It's just trying to take something that exists and from what you have, the thing you have, trying to work out how it works. So rather than sort of having access to the source code um, or the original specification for the program that was written, you've only got the final form or perhaps the source code at a low level and you're trying to work out how it all works so that you can then produce a, an alternative. A classic example of this was Compaq when they cloned the original PC. All the hardware was open standard stuff. You could go buy the chips off the shelf from Intel for the interrupt controller, the CPU and so on. The key that made it a PC though was the IBM proprietary BIOS that was on a chip on the motherboard. So if Compaq wanted to produce a clone, they needed to give their hardware, they couldn't give it the same software because that was copyright, but they needed to give it similar software that worked in exactly the same way so that when you loaded DOS onto it, when you loaded the software, it ran in the same way. So what Compaq would have done is reverse engineered the software. Someone would have sat, they would have taken the BIOS off the motherboard, they would have looked at the bytes stored in that uh, ROM chip, and then they would have worked out how that BIOS program ran on the computer, and then they could then produce a specification to create their own. Another time you might use it, you may have a piece of software that is no longer supported or has been around for a while, you need to extract data from it. A classic example of this was the BBC Doomsday system. This was a Philips laser vision player. Which was a, a laser disc multimedia system produced in the late 80s by the BBC, running on the BBC microcomputer system that sort of captured a snapshot of the UK in 1986. But those laser discs are now rotting, literally, uh, and the data is inaccessible unless you can find a working player, a working system, uh, a working BBC micro and so on. So people have reverse engineered the software of that to try and extract the data these days where people use reverse engineering is in cyber security. Um, if you get a piece of malware, you want to know what does that malware does, who wrote it, um, sort of, is, is what I've seen it do the only things it will do or is there some later stage waiting for it to sort of jump out and run at a later point to find out what that malware does. And so again, reverse engineering is one of the tools you would use to sort of work out what that malware does. Let me think about software for a start. Yep. You, when you code something, you then send it usually through some kind of assembler, yep. it turns it into a Yeah, that's a really good place to start. If we think about when we wanted to write a piece of software, we'll normally start off with an idea. Let's say we want to write a, a program to count words in a piece of text. So we start off with that idea and we want to count words. And then as we write that software, we start to break it down into chunks. We start to define how certain things are going to work until eventually we get to a point where we can write the program code. And then once we've written the program code, we can feed that through a compiler, which will produce the machine code. And it'll encode that in a format that the operating system can run. Uh, Cause it's not just usually, unless you're running something like DOS or writing the BIOS on the thing, just raw machine code bytes. You've usually got some data around there that tells it how to load it in, what's the program code, what's data, what other libraries it might link to as well, the form, the executable format. Probably should do a video on that at some point. So at the other end, we're going to end up with a file on our system. And let's just use the windows.exe extension so we know what it is. So we're going to start from an idea and we're going to end up with the program code that we can run. So if we're going in that direction, this is programming, coding, software engineering, whatever you want to call it. So that's in that direction. Reverse engineering is basically going in the other direction. We've got the program. We may know what it does at some point because we've run it. It might be a word processor. It might be a program that counts words. It might be a piece of malware. Where we're unsure of what it does. It might be the BIOS for a PC. We've probably got some high level idea what it is, but we wanted to go in the other direction. So reverse engineering is going in the other direction. So we've got some idea of what the program does, but we also want to know how it does that, how it's implemented. Because if you think about it, if we're trying to write a program that counts words, the cat sat on the mat, full stop, we've got uh, text there. Now, I want to count the words in that. 
Okay, how many words are there? Uh, I've got six. Six. What are you defining as a word as? Oh, uh, yeah. So I, I would say a collection of letters that is preceded or, or whatever by a space. Okay. So if we're going to do that, so that would be one word. Separated by a space. Yeah, separated. But that, that would be two words. That would be three words. Is the full stop part of the word or not? Uh, yeah, TBC. And that's the point. That's one of the things we have to define. So we're starting from the idea. We want to count words. The next thing we have to do is we need to start to define that. So we need to define those ideas in more detail. And this is a simple program. So we need to define what a word is. And we could say something like a word is a run of characters that aren't spaces. Okay, what's a space? Well, it's a character of some sort, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, but again, we need to define it. So a space is ASCII 32, that's the normal space. We probably want to put the tab character, which is ASCII 9. Line free carriage return, so we've got 10, 13, probably some others, that probably do for now. Answers on a postcard for the definition of spaces. We'll do a whole video on what space is and the computer, no, I'm only joking. But, <laughs> but the point I'm making is we have to define what these things are. So as we go from the idea, we start to make it more solid. We start to break it down. So we're sort of breaking the problem down just like we've done here, we now know what a, a word is. We now know what the space between is, the separations between them. We have to define that. Uh, a space is that. And so we could also say here that separate words by one or more spaces. And for a word counting program, we probably don't need any more definitions for that. If we're building something bigger, let's say we're building a word processor, we would have data structures that we need to define how we're going to store a line of text. Do we store a paragraph as a series of lines after they've been formatted or as a single block? And then we say it's the end of paragraph at the end of that. How do we define all those sort of things? We need to define those things. So I'm going to say that we break down the program into a series of data structures. And the other things we have is the program code or the other way of describing that is the algorithms. Nicholas Wirth wrote a book Programs equals data structures plus algorithms. Fred Brooks, the author of The Mythical Man Month, made a, a, a quote that sort of show me your flowcharts, i.e. your program, and conceal your tables, i.e. your data structures, and your program will be a mystery to me. Show me your data structures, show me your tables, and I won't need to look at your flowcharts, I'm paraphrasing, uh, because the program will be obvious. And so we break down the idea into the sort of the data structures, the algorithms we're going to use, and then we will express them in a programming language, and I'm going to use C because what else is there to use? And then that high level language here will start to express these algorithms, let's start to express these data structures as code. At this point, we're probably still thinking in abstract terms. And then once we express that in code, so that's the actual coding part of it, eventually we will compile and we will link this using our compiler to produce the executable. And as we go from the idea here, we're getting further away from just the raw idea, we're getting further away from the data structures towards what the CPU will understand. So it's becoming more specific. Is this yeah. kind of a, is this a standard pipeline? Does everything go through this development pipeline or is this? Pretty much, I mean, yeah, it, you would probably, I mean, while you're coding, you may design the data structure, but that data structure is there, you're breaking it down. It's not that you're gonna have it's not a waterfall. Nothing's ever a waterfall in computer science unless you're doing it wrong. I'm only joking. Uh, you've got the idea that it'll end up being more specific and so on. When we're reverse engineering, effectively what we're trying to do is get to around this sort of stage from only having this. So it might be that we want to work out some of the data structures, how they use in the program, like the BBC Doomsday. We want to be able to process the data, write a new front end for it so it can be accessed on a modern equipment. If it's malware we're looking at, we're probably more interested in what the code's doing because we're interested in how it's doing that and things. If we're reverse engineering the BIOS, we're probably actually interested in both because we want to be able to sort of produce an equivalent. And if we know how it's structured, because that's what other things are using, we know how it's implemented, we can work out the ideas. We can then go off and give it to someone else who can write a new version, never having looked at the original and so on, or we can write a, a report on how 
the malware works so we can then go and sort of look for certain things on our network. We might see as we reverse engineer the malware, for example, that it's going to send data to some IP address or something. We can then set the network up to detect that and then say, hang on, that machine's infected possibly. We can then go and investigate. So reverse engineering is going from something very, very specific, the binary, and getting it to a more general thing. So we've got more of an idea of what's going on. You will use some of the same techniques you would if you've ever read a program. You sometimes you get given a program, the source code to a program, and you just open it up and read it because you want to extend it, you want to add some features to it, or you're just wanting to understand how it works. You're already doing some of the things that you would do when you reverse engineering. It's differences that when you are here, things are very, very specific. Some of the things that you've got here, like if you write a program in C, you'd probably be able to see what the data structures will look like because they will have a struct and you'll see them laid out. You will see an array. And if you're writing something in Java, you'll see the objects define the classes that define those objects and so on. When we've got a binary, when we've got an executable, you can't read it at the human level. If I, um, well, let's just have a look at a binary. If I just cat a binary here, WC, then what we end up with, there are, is some text in it. We can see it's got the Apple certification but the vast majority of it is, well, unreadable. We can make things slightly easier for ourselves and we can run it through a hex dump and just have a look at the, hex, the actual bytes, their values as hexadecimal values. So we do the same thing and I'll put it on screen. We can now start to see what the program looks like. We can see some of the magic hexadecimal numbers that Apple used to identify this as a executable file and what you could do is find out if you looked at the format of this and again we'll do a video on executable formats at some point um, because i think it'd be a good one you can find out within the file probably around here where the program starts and you could and i have done this on a couple of occasions work this out manually you could look at the hexadecimal bytes and say that five five that's what we call the opcode the code that represents an operation that's this that has this effect four eight has some other effect and so on, and we work out what the program does. That's the manual way to do it. The alternative is that we can use a tool called a disassembler, and there's various ones around. The one that is most commonly used is probably IDA, the interactive disassembler, which I've got open here. And when you open up the program in IDA, it converts it into the opcodes that make up that program. So for example, rather than seeing a series of numbers, I see that this is pushing RBP onto the stack. So the machine code instruction push takes the value in a register or some other location and pushes it onto the stack for you. And so you can start to read what the program's doing. And then you can effectively do the same sort of thing that you do if you're reading a program to sort of work out what's going on. But as I said, this is the level that you're dealing with. There's no thing saying this is a data structure you may see the program storing data in a memory location or reading data from a memory location. It's up to you to piece together what these instructions are doing to understand what the program's doing. Now you can do, get the software to help you. So for example, IDA has a view where it'll sort of break the program up based on where there's sort of loops and well, you don't have loops in machine code. What you have are branches or jumps, which you can use to create loops by saying if this condition is met then jump otherwise don't jump don't branch and so what ida tries to do is to sort of break up the program into these blocks and sort of show you with lines between them what's happening at different points that makes it easy to see things but it's still exactly the same code not all disassemblers do that it's a nice feature for looking at what's happening so what you end up doing when you reverse engineering is a bit like being a detective you've got to follow what's going on the program code, as you read it, will give you information about what's going on. And you can infer from that certain things. And so you can look at things and say, OK, that's likely to be an array or that's likely to be forming a linked list. And from that, you can start to infer what the data structures are. You'll probably get it wrong. So you'll need to keep notes and then you'll come back and say, OK, no, it's not that type because of this. Therefore, I can work out what's going on here. So what I've got loaded up at the moment is the word count program, just to see how you can start to unpick what's going on in this program. This program I've never opened up in IDA before. Now, one of the things that makes it easier as a job is that 
it's unusual for the code to exist in isolation. If it wants to do something, it's got to talk to other bits of the system. This program, if it's going to run, needs to talk to the operating system. If it's talking to the operating system, it's going to have to call system calls, which are defined. So if you look on Microsoft website, you can see the Windows system calls. If you look at the documentation on Apple's website, you can see the ones they use, same for Linux. For example, here, I can see that this program here is using the call instruction, and it's calling the get opt library function, which is used to find options that are in the program. So just by opening it up and spotting get up there, I can see that it's also passed a string to get opt. And if I look at the documentation for get opt, man three get opt, then we can see that it takes in three values. The first one is the number of arguments. The second one is the array with those arguments in, the sort of standard argc, argv that you get in a C program. And then the last one is the option string. And that option string is defined here as containing the following elements, individual characters and characters followed by a colon to indicate an option argument is to follow. So we can look through that string and we can spot that string here. And so immediately, just opening this up with a disassembler, I now know that this program can take the options C, L, M, or W. And I can see that it's setting RDX, one of the registers, to have a pointer to that string. Therefore, because I know how functions are called on the x86-64 architecture that I'm looking at here, I know that that's going to be the op string argument. I can say that, okay, this program has four possible arguments, C, L, M, or W. Okay, well, what do they do? Well, we can continue reading through the program and see what they do in the program. And we can also see how the program works at this point. So that's just a, a quick example. I'm not going to go through the whole program to work out how it counts the words, although we could leave that as an exercise to the viewer. You can download a free version of IDA Pro or other disassemblers. There's Binary Ninja. There's a command line one called Radar. There's Ghidra, which is available from the NSA and things that you can play, you can work at. Look at these things. So something like the word counting program is relatively simple and we could have gone further and looked at how it actually sort of counted the words. We could have seen by looking through that code, sort of what does it define a word as? What characters would it take of defining, or what series of characters would it have taken as defining a word? What series of characters would it have taken as defining the, the gaps between the word, the spaces, and so on? And we could have then produced a specification for how that program worked. We can do exactly the same thing with any other piece of software, whether it's the BIOS chip on a PC, whether it's the Doomsday software, we can understand how the data is structured on that. Whether it's a piece of malware, we can use the same ideas, looking at the code, looking at how it manipulates data, and sort of use that to sort of infer from that evidence of how the sort of data is structured, and then we can test that, we can come up with, and what do I mean by test that? Well, we can say, well, if this is, say we think if this is a linked list, say, we think we see some code that says this might be a linked list. We can say, well, okay, is it checking for null at the end of the linked list, which is what you'll often do? Can we see the code doing that? Um, if it isn't, maybe it's a ring buffer and it's doing something like that. We can start to ask questions based on the deductions we make, whether something is whether the deduction stands up. And as we look at more code, that will become more obvious or it'll contradict that deduction. And we can start to sort of piece what's going on in the program. As I said, you can do this with something like the BIOS with the doomsday disks, with the word counting program, or with a piece of malware. And again, there you'll do exactly the same thing to find out what is this malware doing? What part of the system is it trying to infect? How does it try and hide itself on the system? Does it even try and hide itself? Or is it just completely destructive? Um, is it trying to talk to any other systems on the network? It's not the only tool you have for something like malware, but it can really help you to see what's going on and you might find things that you wouldn't spot in other ways. <laughs> a new feature. A new feature, it probably is. Right, uh, Sean is currently reverse engineering his camera to find out how it's oh, worked because he hasn't... Because yeah, right. he hasn't read the manual. But, uh, I have it, read the manual. Uh, it's classic. It's got about four pages and then it's look at the PDF. Yeah, yeah that's the sort so of standard. I've read it as much so, yeah. as I've got. Uh, so go on, yeah.